Good afternoon and welcome to Florida International University's Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. I'm David Kramer, the moderator for today's Facebook Live session on turmoil in the Middle East, where colleagues of mine here at FIU will be assessing the fallout of the killing over the past few days of Iranian Commander Soleimani. And we're very grateful that you could join us here today as we resume a very busy schedule at FIU and 2020 is off to already a very eventful start. Joining me today will be experts on the situation. Uh, to my immediate left is Mohammed Hamayunvash, who is a lecturer in the Department of Politics and International Relations and an expert on Iran's nuclear program, among other things. Next to him is Naisi Sardoui, who is an instructor in the Department of Politics and International Relations and an expert on U.S.-Iranian relations. And last but not least is Eric Loeb, a professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations and an expert on Iran. And all three of you uh, bring tremendous expertise, and we're grateful for you to join us here today. I'm going to start with a very basic question in light of what happened late last week with the order by President Trump to launch an attack that led to the killing of Commander Soleimani. Um, how big a deal is this? Mohammed? Let's, let's start with you. Well, I think it kind of changes everything uh, as far as the relationship between Iran and the United States is concerned. And maybe the larger uh, question of the United States' role in the Middle East. Because ordinarily, we think of the United States' uh, role in the Middle East in terms of countering terrorism, countering proliferation, supporting Israel, uh, energy security, and if you're a little bit more charitable, democratization. And now I think on all those fronts, we have major challenges and I would say long-term dilemmas. For example, when it comes to counter-proliferation, Iran just uh, pulled out, you know, partially pulled out or suspended its commitments under the JCPOA, the nuclear deal. And uh, they might even take it further and reduce their commitments under the non-proliferation treaty, which would be a major strategic challenge for the entire you know, counter-proliferation regime. Uh, when it comes to countering terrorism, obviously, I think we have suspended our counter-ISIS operations now. So we've moved to a force protection posture. And uh, how long we'll have to keep that posture and we might you know, get kicked out of Iraq. So that will be another strategic challenge in terms of you know, that counter-terrorist uh, operation. When it comes to you know, security of energy, I think that also uh, this operation in assassinating General Soleimani, I think presents a major challenge in terms of disruption of uh, you know, flow of oil from the Strait of Hormuz. And Iran could do serious damage to uh, security of supply. I think oil was just hovering around 70 bucks uh, today, and it might go up. I mean, if, if the Iranians could keep pressure on oil prices and push it up to about 100 bucks, then we'll have to pay, I guess, upwards of four bucks at the pump here. So that will be a major you know, uh, problem, not just in a strategic sense, but even at the more retail level for, for average American. So I think this was uh, not properly gamed out. It was not thought through in a strategic sense. And I have a feeling that it was done uh, impulsively and with a lot of uh, emotionality involved. Nicey, do you see this as a game changer? I do. Um, I'm looking at what was happening in Iran, what's happening in Iraq, what's happening in Lebanon in the last couple of months. Um, people are aware, obviously, of the attack um, that took place on the, uh, the embassy, right? The, the militias that um, walked up to the embassy and obviously challenged the Americans there. Um, but uh, last couple of months ago, there was an attack on the Iranian uh, consulate in Karbala. And last year, there was an attack on the Iranian consulate in Basra. Um, there had been protesters in, in Iraq, people that have been calling for end of corruption and a government that's responsive to the people in Iraq. Um, and, you know, obviously many of them have also felt grievances expressed towards the Iranians. Um, and within Iran, you also had, uh, you know, pretty serious, violent, you know, massive uh, uh, clashes, right, um, where you had the, the Internet basically being blocked. Um, well, you know, media um, being blocked, um, social media and whatnot from, from the Iranians. So um, now you see these massive, you know, gatherings, morning ceremonies, and they're huge. Um, 
we're not talking about tens of thousands, we're not talking about hundreds of thousands, we're talking about millions. And in places where, like Avas, where in 2017, there was an attack um, on a military parade by, um, you know, by a group that certainly feel, felt disenfranchised towards the government and, and, and attacked there. Um, so I think that in the last couple of months, uh, you know, the Iranian government was probably quite nervous. And uh, we're not seeing that now. Uh, we are seeing massive gatherings throughout the whole of Iran. And I think that the Iranian people, regardless of the immense grievances that many of them do have towards the government, they are basically showing a show of unity. Um, that, you know, they're, they're going to they're gonna side, not side with the government, but basically they're going to, they're going to show that they, they care about their nation and they don't want to see the same thing that happened to Afghanistan on one side, the same thing that happened to Iraq and the same thing that happened to Syria. And if we go further out to Libya, um, they don't want to experience that. So I think this show of support is also based on that show of unity. But the other thing that I'm also seeing is um, how this has also affected transnational Shiism. Because it's not just these demonstrations in Iraq, but you have the in Iran, you have the demonstrations in Iraq. Mm -hmm. You had massive demonstrations in Kashmir among the Shia of Kashmir. You had even demonstrations by Bahrainis who are under immense pressure after the shutdown of the Arab Spring there in 2011. And so I think that this has really ignited a fervor and fury you know, throughout the Shia, the Shia world, not just Iran. So Eric, jump in here on the significance of this and also a point that Nicey was making about does, does this bring Iranians together? Does it make them more united at a time when the government was under some pressure? Well, yeah, I mean, there was a, a substantial protests in Iran in, in November. Um, and given the pressure that the uh, government, the Iranian government was under, it responded in, in the most repressive way that it has since 1979. We're talking about 300 at least people killed um, and, you know, thousands arrested. I mean, the, the numbers are not clear, but it, the, the repression has definitely gone up um, inside of Iran. Um, as my colleague said, there was... Um, demonstrations against Iran, not just inside of Iran, uh, against the Iranian government, but also, you know, throughout uh, the Middle East and the Shia world, and that since this attack, it has now shifted um, in the direction of anti-Americanism, that, that America looks to be more of the problem than, than Iran is for regional stability. Um, Iraq feeling caught between a conflict between Iran and the United States, and the United States having just upped the ante uh, and put the Iraqi government in a very difficult position, which is why the parliament voted yesterday um, I mean, it was a non-binding resolution, but to, uh, you know, a, a non-binding resolution to call for withdrawal of U.S. troops, 5,000 plus troops in Iraq. But, you know, to get back to the original question in terms of the significance yeah. of this, uh, you know, that hasn't been stated, this was a, a, an assassination on a senior government and military official in Iran. It's like assassinating, uh, you know, the head of CENTCOM in the United States. But, but, you know, beyond a military figure, he was even also a diplomat where he was uh, negotiating deals. And, th and there are reports that he was even invited to Iraq uh, to try to um, uh, mitigate tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia with the Iraqi government as an intermediary. The Iraqi prime minister himself yesterday at that parliamentary session said that he had invited Soleimani uh, for that purpose. Um, and he was, you know, um, killed outside of the uh, outside of Baghdad airport on his way for that mission. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, he was not just a military figure, but he was also a diplomatic figure in many ways as well. So, um, you know, up until that point, when the Trump administration withdrew from the nuclear deal in May 2018, the conflict between the United States and Iran was indirect through proxy. The, the, um, you know, the United States initiated or reinitiated economic warfare against Iran through crippling sanctions. And Iran responded in a very calculating way. First, it was restraint to see if the Europeans, the Chinese, and the Russians would, would isolate the United States and stay with the nuclear deal. When the Europeans started wavering and increased pressure went up against the Iranians, they responded, again, very calculating way. Uh, maximum resistance against maximum pressure, but avoiding a direct confrontation with the United States, hitting tankers, hitting the oil fields and, and refineries in Saudi Arabia. And the closest it got was June last year when they took down an unmanned U.S. drone. And the U.S. was contemplating a direct strike on Iran, but President Trump called it off. Now, with this assassination against a senior 
military official that previous administrations supposedly could have taken out but did not to avoid direct confrontation in Iran, we now find ourselves in a much higher probability of directly engaging Iran in, 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 a, in a conflict, which um, does not put us just in dangerous territory for uh, U.S.-Iran relations, but also for regional stability at large. So before, before we get to what might come next, including Iran's response to this, let me just pick up, though, on, on what you were describing about Soleimani as a military figure, a government official, but even critics of President Trump's decision would say this is a man with the blood of hundreds or thousands of people on his hands. What, what, what kind of person are we talking about here? Maybe, Eric, if you want to start, we'll sure. work our way back. I mean, that's absolutely right. Um, at times, he's cooperated with the United States, so he was instrumental in uh, when we initially went in after 9-11 against mm -hmm. the Taliban, so he, he was cooperating with the United States on that front. He was also instrumental in terms of defeating ISIS um, in Iraq and Syria, which is why he's a national hero, and again, U.S.-Iran interests aligned. But one of his missions was to make the United States uncomfortable in Iraq, because the strategic uh, calculus in Tehran was that after the of Saddam Hussein, Iran, which had been put into the axis of evil in 2002, would be next. So the mission was, and these were direct orders from the Iranian leadership that Suleiman, uh, that Qasem Soleimani carried out, was to make the U.S. uncomfortable in Iraq and to prevent them from marching on into Tehran or elsewhere. Um, so he was responsible for organizing uh, Shiite militias in Iraq that killed American servicemen. He provided um, IEDs that were able to penetrate uh, tanks and armored vehicles. And so he absolutely does have uh, the blood of American troops on his hands, hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, this was war. Mm -hmm. And the United States invaded Iraq in 2003. And we have, um, you know, thousands of uh, Iraqi military uh, officers and soldiers, but also civilians that have been killed as a result of this conflict. So unless we believe in American exceptionalism, uh, which some people, of course, do, it's hard to see you know, who has the moral high ground. I'm not justifying. I mean, this was definitely a tactical win for the United States. But you know, as my colleagues mentioned, uh, it, you know, just like the, our regime change policies, you know, the day after is not thought through in terms of all the implications and consequences and all the strategic losses or, or disadvantages that this has created. Does one of you want to jump in? On, on and I just want to. Uh, also add that this guy was traveling on a diplomatic passport. So because I see in the media sometimes he's likened to bin Laden or al-Baghdadi. Mm -hmm. And this is not a person who kind of slipped through, you know, uh, the border. So he was traveling under his own name on a diplomatic passport and went through the regular, you know, uh, process at the Baghdad International Airport. So I think we need to have uh, keep that in mind in terms of, you know, how big of a tactical you know, uh, success in terms of, you know, an operation this was. So this was not a hidden person, as I'm trying to say. But in terms of the moral high ground, I just don't know. I hear a lot in the media that this was a bad dude. So this is, I think, one of the, you know, uh, more uh, kind of vocal lines of defense for the assassination, but... That, that we shed no tears over this Yeah, death, but right? I don't know since when bad dudeism has become, you know, a foreign policy uh, paradigm. So I just find it uh, very difficult to buy into that argument that, you know, that our foreign policy is formulated and is implemented on moral ground. So I think that moralism is actually, uh, to me, it's indicative of the fact that our national security interests were not advanced by assassinating this guy. And I think they were significantly set back. And that's, I think, why people take sanctuary in that moral argument, because ordinarily we don't uh, operate on, you know, on purely moral grounds in, you know, in terms of our uh, foreign policy formulation. So, Nicey, could you jump in also on the Iran-Iraq relationship? Because I think for a lot of Americans old enough, they remember in the 1980s, a terrible war fought mm -hmm. between these two countries with what, close to if not more than a million losses on each side. H how is it that these countries are now in, in a relationship that is much closer than I think many people might have imagined. Sure, I mean, um, when people are looking at the people demonstrating uh, in Iran or pouring out, you know, so not support, I would say, but maybe the morning ceremonies, right, or the, the show of unity that we see in different cities in Iran, um, people have a different narrative of Soleimani and who Soleimani was. And as, as Eric has pointed out, they see him as a person that would help to defeat ISIS. 
they see him also as uh, the fighter that went and they also, also was fighting against the Taliban. If you remember, the Taliban killed a number of, of uh, American, uh, not American, I'm sorry, a couple of also Iranian um, personnel that were mm -hmm. back in 1996, I think it was, or 97, and there was almost a conflict between Iran and Afghanistan over the, this, uh, before the 2001 events of 9-11. Um, so they, they also see that, and then they see this person that went and he fought against ISIS or the Islamic State. But even before that, um, how does he make his way up? He makes his way up the ranks because he fought um, during the Iran-Iraq war. He's a, he's a soldier during that war. And so he's seen also as a defender of, of Iran when Iran was attacked by, by Iraq. Um, and as you mentioned, this was a brutal war. Um, fewer than one million, but oftentimes people get that, that mm -hmm. you know, that it was about a million. Um, from both sides, and wherein the Iraqis also, Saddam Hussein launched chemical weapons on the Iranians for a period of, probably during much of the of that war effort. So it was a def devastating loss. So for the Iranians, I think when the United States um, overthrew the government of Saddam Hussein, um, they're kind of in a bind, and sort of like as Eric was saying, on the one hand, it brings this possibility of having many of these Iraqis that had fled Iraq in 1980 and also then later on after the, the Gulf War in 1990, 91, um, gives them an opportunity to come back um, to Iraq. And now the Iranians obviously are gonna have allies there because Iraq predominantly is 60% Shia. So you have a significant Shia population and this Shia population is seen as you know, having something in common, that religious affinity, cultural affinity, um, to be perceived different from the Ba'ath Party. So I think from, from uh, for the Iranian perspective, on the one hand, this gives them uh, an incredible uh, possibility of influence and to have a different neighbor, right, than what they had under Ba'athist ruled um, Iraq. Um, but then we have basically what, what happens with uh, the civil war in, in Iraq. People have mentioned that Soleimani and these uh, Iraqi militias have um, American blood on their hands, and Eric has you know, explained that. But in between 2003 and 2004, there were about 500 insurgent attacks on the United States weekly. And these insurgent attacks were not coming from the Shia. You know, they were coming predominantly from the Sunni areas. Mm -hmm. And there is very little mention we see now. It's almost like these Shia militias were just out to get the, the Americans, but we don't see anything about the complexity of the civil war during this time period. Um, so. And, and you had fighters that were coming in um, to Iraq, and they were coming in from other Sunni countries to fight against the Americans and to fight against the Shia uh, in Iraq. So it's, it's a very complex situation where the two sides have significant grievances. Um, but uh, that I, was an existential threat yeah. to Iran. The way yeah. the Iranians, you know, and why they fought back was because, you know, of that axis of evil speech by President Bush, and, you know, essentially Bush said, you know, uh, Take a number and get in line. You're next for regime change. Mm -hmm. And obviously the Iranians were seriously uh, concerned that they were next in line. So they wanted to make uh, the operation in Iraq as painful, as slow as possible. And so that was part of that you know, bigger strategy that I think we need to keep in mind when we talk about you know, these uh, casualties that, were, uh, that you know, the United States sustained in that operation. Eric, let's, let's turn to what the response might be coming from Iran. I heard over the weekend, I think it was Karim Sanjapur, say that Ayatollah Khomeini either saves face by launching a response or he has to worry about saving his head, that if he doesn't do something, he'll be in trouble. How do you see the, the uh, retaliation or response coming from Iran? Well, I mean, the supreme leader has vowed revenge. Uh, the, the president of Iran, Rouhani, alluded to it. I mean, this is, as we've discussed before, this has unified the elites, and they all seem to be saying the same thing for the time being, that there will be a response. Now, right now, the Iranians can be patient. They could wait and, and already see how the blowback is going to occur, as we've seen with, uh, with you know, the Iraqi parliament voting to uh, expel U.S. troops from Iraq, uh, you know, pro mass protests going on. Uh, there were apparently more rockets fired by Shia militias in, uh, in Iraq at, uh, at, at U.S. military and Iraqi military bases that were aligned with the U.S. And then they, you know, they, they're going to be strategic. I mean, they are, they're, they've been very strategic since the U.S. withdrawal from the nuclear deal. Um, as I said, they want to inflict cost on the United States and their allies, driving up oil prices by hitting tankers, 
uh, you know, hitting Saudi oil fields. You notice that the, the Gulf states have been very quiet, actually, and have even reached out to Iran. As, you know, and even, as I said, in terms of uh, transmitting messages through the Iraqi government between Iran and Saudi Arabia, even direct meetings between Emirati security officials and Iranian security officials, because they're on the front lines of this just as much as the U.S., I mean, with our assets over there, and now we're sending more. Um, even though we want to, <laughs> President Trump campaigned on a promise to withdraw from the Middle East, but now we seem to get more engaged. So it's another, looks like another strategic uh, loss here. Um, but, uh, you know, getting back to your question, there's different ways that Iran can respond. So that's one way. And also, again, using its proxies that it's developed. Because it's been facing embargoes and sanctions by the U.S. and the international community for 40 years, this is the way that it's done it on the cheap in terms of, uh, and, and Soleimani was instrumental in, in this strategy, particularly after the Iran-Iraq war, where Iran was really, uh, you know, backed against the wall. Uh, it wasn't just that it was facing Iraq, but uh, most, uh, most countries in the region and even outside of it were supporting Iraq against Iran. So after that, and Soleimani being a part of that, he wasn't just a soldier in the Iran-Iraq war, but also commander, understanding that Iran needed strategic depth after that. So creating uh, links with uh, politicians and militiamen uh, around uh, the region, uh, Lebanon with Hezbollah, uh, Iraq and, and, and elsewhere. And so now it has this instrument that it could use, this tool that it could use uh, to inflict pain and costs on the U.S. and its allies in the region, not to mention globally, although it hasn't been as successful outside of the Middle East in terms of you know, having operatives in different countries. We um, saw uh, responses in, uh, in Latin America and Eastern Europe. Um, against the, the United States, uh, Israel. There was a failed attempt against the Saudi ambassador here in the United States. Um, so, you know, there's lots of options, and I think the Iranians are not necessarily going to respond right away, but they're going to think about what tools they could use at their disposal and what they could do to send a message and to show that they've responded, but at the same time still try to avoid a direct conflict with the United States where they're conventionally inferior to the United States. Mohammed, what does this do for the Iran agreement on the nuclear situation, which the Europeans, the Russians, the Chinese have hoped to maintain? The United States, of course, last year broke from, uh, two years ago, and 2018 broke from it. Um, it, it. The Iranians have already made some statements indicating that they are going to move ahead in some areas. I think traditionally, Iranians have been a cool customer. They didn't do anything herky-jerky normally. This is not their style. But I think if you're, if you're an Iranian strategist and you're looking at this picture and the way these developments are uh, unfolding, you're thinking that there's probably a major hole in your deterrent posture. Because now Iranians are thinking that would the United States uh, do the same thing to a North Korean general? Mm -hmm. And the answer probably no and because North Korea has uh, nuclear weapons. So I think this, from a purely rational perspective, would probably incentivize the Iranians to, uh, to develop some sort of nuclear weapons capability. Maybe they, maybe they will want to shorten the, the breakout window. So right now it's about a year. Maybe they'll, they'll, they would want to shorten it to about a month or two weeks or something like that. But I think this, if anything, will incentivize Iran to, to push that nuclear envelope a little bit more assertively and aggressively. So for all intents and purposes, I think this is a major blow to the counterproliferation regime that we were uh, trying to, to enforce in the Middle East. Nicey, last question I to you. I just actually wanted sure. to jump in also with, because sure, uh, sure. the, uh, the attacks also on the facilities, that the tankers and also the facility at Abqaiq in Saudi Arabia, um, I think for the Iranians and what many analysts have, have seen this as is the Iranians trying to get the Europeans also to be involved and to try to save the JCPOA. Um, and that Europeans didn't really have much of a, a response that felt meaningful also for, for the Iranians to try to get out of this quagmire of maximum pressure that the Trump administration has placed them under. So I wanted to sort of yeah. add that as well. So let me, let me get a quick answer to a complicated question from each of you, and then we'll, we'll have to wrap up, unfortunately. This has gone very quickly. Um, a, a lot of people, I'm sure, in the Persian Gulf region, but also here in the United States, are now worried, are we about to go to war, the United States and Iran? Um, how, how would you answer that question? Start with Eric. 
Well, it's definitely brought us closer. Um, and I think, again, Iran will respond asymmetrically, but still try to avoid a, a direct co a conventional confrontation with the U.S., knowing, because at the end of the day, uh, I mean, the irony is it, it seems that like the U.S. is actually responding more and more irrationally. And a, a country that we labeled a bunch of clerical fanatics actually seems to be uh, responding in a more calculating way. And I expect for that to continue. Uh, I think the bigger question, too, is if I can add this point, is in terms of what implications does this have for the U.S. As a, as a player, not just in the Middle East, but even in the international system, in terms of the legalities of this kind of attack, in terms of the norms, because this is different, as we said, from a, a drone strike against you know, terrorist non-state actors. This was a drone strike against a high-level government official. So, you know, how, what are the implications of, the, uh, of this going to be in terms of international relations moving forward? And now, you know, the, the role that the U.S. is going to play in the international system. Thanks. Yeah, my preoccupation with not watching just what is Iran going to do next is thinking about how on earth are we going to de-escalate from this? Because I think that the population's support in Iran is basically giving the, the government also more pressure that they have to somehow respond. Um, and then from the U.S. side, as the, they see this outcome in Iran and the Iranian sort of response to the United States, then in terms of just verbal, right, um, you have a president that has actually even gone to the extreme of basically saying that we have listed 52 places in Iran that we're going to bomb, including Iranian cultural sites, which has actually brought in Iranians who have a very long civilization, right, Cyrus the Great, you know, looking at, you know, this, this idea of, you know, this is our culture. Culture, this is our state, this is, this is us, um, that they, they themselves feel under attack, not the regime. Um, and so I think that how, how do we de-escalate when the, the rhetoric from both sides, the social media circles, the, the media itself is, I think, gradually feeding into the frenzy and pushing the two leaders to become more and more aggressive and more vocal in their rhetoric towards each other. So there's, you know, between that and between also, you know, the regional grievances that we mentioned about this, you know, pan Shia sort of sentiment that you could have anybody, not necessarily even just an Iranian, carry out something that then may be blamed on Iran. Mohammed, last word. Well, I, I think we need a paradigm shift in this country about Iran. I think I, I mentioned it last time we talked about Iran as well, that, you know, because in this country sometimes I feel like uh, politicians talk about a fictional Iran. An Iran that is irrational, that is impulsive, that is expansionist, that is a proliferator, that is even suicidal. These are words that are thrown around as part of the conventional wisdom about Iran. And then we devise our policies that are maybe appropriate for that fictional Iran. But the real Iran, as we see, the real Iran is maybe is more rational than we think, is more status quo than revisionist is more, you know, uh, more calculating and shrewd, is more strategic. And then I think we have to shift our policy to deal with that real Iran. And then maybe, maybe we'll get more, you know, stable Middle East and more, you know, longevity for our foreign policy objectives. So I hope that, like I said, we, we make that leap of faith and paradigm shift about Iran deal with, the, with Iran as it is, but unfortunately there is just way too much, I think, politics and ideology mm -hmm. when it comes to foreign policy formulation about Iran. So bad that I think, unfortunately, our intelligence community has been poisoned as well. So I see a lot of politics involved, in even in the way our intelligence community frames Iran. And you know, as we know from Iraq, politicization of intelligence is the worst thing that could happen. And then that could obviously undermine the quality of your foreign policy decisions. So uh, if reports are correct that uh, Pompeo was at the forefront of decision to, to go to, you know, to pull the trigger on, on Soleimani, then I'm unfortunately not very sanguine about you know, the way forward. Mohammed, Nicey, Eric, thanks so much to the three of you for sharing your insights and for a fascinating conversation. That brings us to the end of this first uh, series here in 2020 for Florida International University, Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. Thanks very much for joining us. Please join us this Thursday and Friday where Florida International University will host its third State of the World 2020, where among other issues, we will take another look at the situation in the Middle East and with the situation with Iran. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm David Kramer. We'll see you next time.